What we're going to be doing now is we are going to cover the first half of this outline in our church service. And then we're going to start with section two at two o'clock this afternoon. And so we'll be able to fit that in nicely. So I'm not going to keep you here unduly long in this morning service. Let's begin with prayer again. Father, again, as we open your word, we ask that your spirit will guide us into all truth, that we may understand as best we can what your will for us really is. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Would you turn to Philippians chapter 2 with me, our first text. Philippians chapter 2. We will begin with verse 5. If I were to pick out one verse which would summarize everything I want to say to you this weekend, this is the verse. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you think that's a desirable thing to have? The mind of Christ? Two things. If we can have the mind of Christ, that means His mind can't be all that different from our mind. And desperately, we need to pray to have His mind. That means His way of doing things, His attitudes, his, uh, the, the way He talked, all of these things. We need to pray for that mind. If we can really experience the mind of Christ, we go home real soon, my friends. And then it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That really is a magnificent passage, isn't it? From the very beginning to the very end of the great controversy, all in just a few verses right there. Uh, that last verse especially, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Isn't that what the whole battle, the great controversy is all about? Will every tongue really confess that? Not just us who believe in Jesus Christ, but the every being who has ever lived, will they say, yes, Jesus Christ is rightful Lord of this universe. We're over a thousand years away from that happening, my friends. In addition to the things that will transpire at the end of our period of Earth's history, there is a thousand more years of understanding, of clarification, of better understanding of the great issues at stake. And finally, finally, every tongue will admit, even Satan himself. I'm waiting for the day. I'm waiting to see that day when Satan himself comes walking down before the throne of God and says in the presence of every human who has ever lived on planet Earth, your way is right, God. My way is wrong. It doesn't work. The most merciful thing you can do for me is to end my existence. When it is clear that God is not taking vengeance on those who have opposed Him, but is ending it in the only way that will preserve the universe for all eternity, that will be a day to look forward to. Let's go back now to verse 7. The King James translation actually adds a few words that were not in the original language when it says, made himself of no reputation. The original is simpler. It says, he emptied himself. And so the question I'm asked here in the first question of what did Christ empty himself when he came down to this earth? What didn't he bring with him as he came down to be a human being? So we've listed, I've listed a number of points here. We're going to go through them this morning briefly. Omnipotence. That means all power. Turn with me to John chapter 5, verse 30. We're going to read some texts which I would not have expected Jesus to say. They're surprising texts. Don't seem like what I would think He would say. John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. Now just wait a minute. That can't be right. 
Who is this Jesus that was born in Bethlehem? What was his name way back in Old Testament times when the Israelites knew him by a different name? What was his name? Yahweh. Yahweh. Correct. We translate it as Jehovah, which is a mistranslation, but we understand what it means. The great Yahweh, when He speaks, does nothing happen? Now come on, what happens when Yahweh speaks? Everything, whatever He says, happens immediately. Jesus is Yahweh, my friends. And now He says, I can of mine own self do nothing. A dramatic change has taken place in Jesus Christ between Old Testament and New Testament times. Even in the last half of the verse, it gets more unusual. He says, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. I would have expected Jesus to say, I seek my will and the will of my Father, because they're both the same. He didn't say that. We'll look at that a little later. Right now we're focusing on Jesus' power, His omnipotence. And Jesus says, I've laid it aside. Now, if you'll take a look at this outline you've been given, you'll notice it's a little thicker than the one we had earlier. And if you are doing your own study, which I hope you will do after this weekend, you will notice on the outline on the front page there are Roman numerals and letters, 1A, B, C, etc. If you look at the Ellen White statements, you will find the same Roman numerals and letters, so you will know which statements go to which parts of the outline as you study it for yourself. 1A, the very first one, from Desire of Ages 336. Jesus and the disciples were in the little boat on the Sea of Galilee, afraid for their lives, and we read this, He, Christ, rested not in the possession of almighty power. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that He reposed in quiet. That power He had laid down, and He says, I can of mine own self do nothing. He trusted in the Father's might, it was in faith, faith in God's love and care, that Jesus rested, and the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God. So when Jesus said, Peace be still, it was a prayer, and the Father answered that prayer by stilling the sea. That's how Jesus did His miracles. I've just listed one statement here, but that is the way Jesus performed His miracles when He was on this earth, by appealing to His Father, and by the Father responding to Him, in carrying out what Jesus' request was. Jesus lays aside His omnipotence. Why? Because you and I have no omnipotence at all. You and I are totally dependent on outside power if we are going to receive any help from supernatural sources. And God is that power. Jesus does not come to live as God. They had seen Yahweh all down through the history of the Old Testament. They knew what Yahweh could do. What they needed to see was what a human being could do in dependence upon God. And Jesus came to live as every human being must live, with no power used of Himself. He depended on His Father's power. So voluntarily, He laid aside that power. He could have called it back at any time, but he chose not to use it. I think that was the hardest temptation of Christ during his entire life on earth, to choose not to exercise the power that he had available to him. All right? That's omnipotence. In your outline again, first page. Memory. Memory. Luke 2.52. I think you can repeat that one from memory with me without even looking it up. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. How does the great Yahweh increase in wisdom? He has all wisdom. He doesn't have to ask anyone. He knows, end from beginning. Jesus increases in wisdom. How does that work? Let's go again. We're going to go back and forth quite a bit to the Ellen White statements, section 1B. From Desire of Ages, page 70. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. He gained knowledge as we may do. Now just consider that for a little bit. It's one of the most amazing things that I've ever come across. Do you, can you just picture Jesus as a five-year-old, a four-year-old, a three-year-old coming to mo his mommy one day and asking, why do we start the Sabbath when the sun goes down and then we keep it a whole day and we close it when the sun goes down? And Mary would tell the little boy, because Yahweh told us to. 
Can you just imagine that? He had to learn what he had done because he did not have memory of the past. In common terms, he would be called a total amnesiac. He laid aside his memory because you and I don't have memory of the past. And he starts where we do. Again, from the same page. He who had made all things studied the lessons which his own hand had written in earth and sea and sky. You heard about a rainbow this morning. And I, I just imagine that one day G, uh, Jesus came into his mother asking, why is that out in the sky with all the different colors after the rain? And his mother said, because Yahweh put it there as a promise that there would never be again, again be a flood to destroy the earth. The next statement in Desire of Ages, pages 78, takes us to the time when he was 12 years old. When he was 12 years of age, his parents took him to the temple for the first time in his life. That was the custom. You did not go until that age of passage. Of passage. And for the first time in Jesus' young life, he saw a lamb being sacrificed by the priests. And at that moment, something came into the mind of that young 12-year-old child as he saw the lamb being sacrificed. Remember this, thing, this point. How in the world did Jesus figure out what his mission was, what his purpose was, why he was here? Now, Mary, his mother, could tell him a great deal. But did Mary or anyone around Nazareth tell him that he would die on a cross hated by his own people for the sins of the entire world? Not one. How in the world would he learn what his mission was, what he was sent here to do? No memory of the past. How would he find out? what he was sent here to do. Well, what, uh, what available sources do you have to figure out what the Lord's will is for your life? Prayer. What else can we depend on? Scripture. What else do we need? The Holy Spirit. We have sources that we can use to understand God's will. Jesus had those same sources. Did he study the Bible as a young child? Did he know those scriptures? When he saw that lamb being sacrificed, can't you just imagine that a text from Isaiah around chapter 53 came into his mind about a lamb being led to the slaughter? And all of a sudden at that moment the Holy Spirit comes down upon that 12-year-old mind and said, this is what you were sent here to do. Not to be a conqueror, not to lead your people against the Romans, but to die as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Did you notice that right after that he said to his parents, don't you know that I have to be about my father's business? And he didn't mean the carpenter. My father's business. So at that point, Jesus began to understand his mission. Keep this in mind. He did not know what his mission was at age 10, at age 11 and a half. But at that time and from that time forward, he began to understand gradually what he was sent here to do. And it is the most amazing thing. We don't have any records of Jesus' life between the age of 12 and 30. He spent 18 years in preparation for that mission. 18 years of, of praying to his heavenly Father of how this would be done. 18 years of getting ready for it. This was a very important period in Jesus' life that we know virtually nothing about. I'm waiting to learn a little more about it when God unfolds some things uh, about that period of time. And so Jesus does not know who He is in terms of His mission. He learns who He is. He learns what His mission is. That means that everything Jesus did during His life on earth is an act of faith, not knowledge. Faith not memory. Faith, not supernatural ability of His own, but total trust in His Heavenly Father's guidance day by day. Total trust in His Heavenly Father's guidance. Jesus' life is a faith life. And you know what? That's all God is asking us to have, is some faith in Him. Just trust Him. Just trust Him. He will lead you. He will guide you if we have faith. Jesus showed how righteousness works by faith. And he asks us to experience that righteousness by faith. Dramatic uh, little section here. The mystery of his mission, it says, was opening to the Savior. Desire of Ages, page 78. At that moment, that mysterious mission came open to Jesus Christ. And from then on, he knew what he was sent here to be. 
All right, back to the outline on the first page. Foreknowledge, section C. Foreknowledge, knowledge of the future. Please turn with me to Mark 13, verse 32. One more of the strange statements. Jesus has spent an entire chapter describing events that would take place between His first and second comings. And now we come to the end of the story, the dramatic part of the story, in verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. What did Jesus just tell us now? He said, you don't know, human beings don't know, angels don't even know, I don't even know the day and the hour. Only the Father knows this. Now remember, all of the statements that we are reading, these strange statements, apply between His birth and His death. Not before, not after. These are statements made during His life as a human being. And during His life as a human being, He did not know when He was coming back. Why? Because apparently the Father hadn't chosen to reveal that to Him. The Father told Him many things. And the whole chapter is about what the Father had revealed to Jesus. Signs in the sun, moon, and stars. All kinds of things. But the Father did not tell Jesus that point, the day and the hour. So Jesus simply says, I don't know. Isn't that a good bit of advice for us today? When it's not clearly spelled out here, can we be honest enough to say, I don't know? We get ourselves into so much trouble trying to know more than God has told us. Trying to figure out the mysteries and trying to sort it all out and make it all work out in, uh, as, as best we can think it through. Let's be content to say whatever has been revealed to us is for us to know. And whatever has not been revealed to us is for us to have faith that God will make it clear. That will save us so much trouble if we're willing to do that. And Jesus was willing to do that. Now, go to the Ellen White Statements one more time. Section 1C. Desire of Ages, page 147. Before He came to earth, the plan lay out before Him, perfect in all its detail. But as He walked among men, He was guided step by step by the Father's will. What you've just read there in sentence 1 is Yahweh. In sentence 2 is Jesus. Before and during His life on earth. The next one from Ministry of Healing 479, Christ in His life on earth made no plans for Himself. He accepted God's plans for Him, and day by day the Father unfolded His plans. Day by day. That's how Jesus knew where to go, who to talk to, what to say. Day by day, getting information. Can you imagine that those nights of prayer that you read about where Jesus spent all night in prayer were more than just devotional praying? They were information gathering sessions. Father, what do you want me to know? Where am I supposed to go? And I'm going to suggest that when we come into situations where we don't know what the next day is going to bring, maybe some nights of prayer will help us to understand God's will so that we know where we are to go and what we are to do. The next paragraph, the, the next statement in Desire of Ages 753 is one of the most profound I have ever read in inspired writings. The Savior, this is His death on the cross, the Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to Him His coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell Him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. Now that's a difficult statement. It seems to contradict statements in the Bible. Didn't Jesus say on more than one occasion, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up? Did He not say to His disciples, Go before Me into Galilee, and I will meet you there after I am raised from the dead? Did not Jesus believe that His death would not be a permanent death? It would be a temporary death. He would be raised by the Father. How did He learn about that? Again, remember, not by His own mind, but by the Father's telling Him that's the way it was going to be. And He trusted His Father. But something dramatic is happening as Jesus is moving into this final experience. If you read the story in Desire of Ages, as Jesus walks with His disciples from the Last Supper, the Upper Room experience, to the um, Garden of Gethsemane, as He's talking with His disciples about important last counsel to give to them, He stumbles three times. 
and would have fallen to the ground if his disciples had not been right there to hold him up and he did not fall to the ground. What is happening to this strong young carpenter from Nazareth because he can't even walk straight anymore without falling? What's happening? Something he had never experienced before in all eternity. What does sin cause between us and God? Separation. From all eternity he had been one with the Father. During his life on earth he had been one with his Father. He had kept kept in close contact. That was his reason for existence, his connection with the Father. Now, we don't sense that quite as as much as Jesus because we run from the Father pretty much a good share of the time. We don't sense the separation. We're just kind of doing our own thing. And we don't feel that separation nearly as much as Jesus did because he was always with his Father. I hope we come to the place where we will feel a real, real serious sense of separation when we rebel against God knowing what we're doing to ourselves, hurting our relationship with God. And so this separation struggle for Jesus was momentous. As he walks into the garden, he says, Take this cup from me. What cup is he asking? The separation cup. I don't know if I can bear it. And then he adds another phrase, doesn't he? Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. His will was to walk away from that separation experience. God's will was for him to go through it. And he goes to the cross. Now, I don't know, obviously, everything that went through Jesus' mind on the cross of Calvary, but something like this had to be the struggle of Jesus Christ. Father, I am here because you sent me. I did not come here on my own. I am here because of your plan. But right now, I don't know where you are. I can't see your face. My prayers don't get through to you anymore. You aren't hearing me. You aren't listening to me. You aren't responding to me. And I understand why. I am the sin bearer. And, I have, and, and you have to pull back from me in mercy because God's glory destroys sin. And now His Son is full of the sin of the world. And so I understand, Father. But right now, I don't know if I can survive this. I don't know if I can get through this in separation from you. And then he has to say something like this in his own mind. Whatever your will is, God, my God, your will be done. If I never see your face again, and that honors your name, and you defeat Satan in the great controversy, your will be done. If you choose to raise me from the dead as you have told me in the past, then your will be done. Did the three three Hebrews in the fiery furnace say something like that? We don't know if you'll preserve us, Lord, but we will trust you to do the right thing. And Jesus is saying virtually that same thing. Whatever vindicates your name, whatever brings an end to sin on this planet, your will be done, even if that costs my eternal existence. Remember, Jesus' mind is functioning as a human mind, not as a divine mind right now. And he is struggling with the promises that he had been given throughout his life that don't seem real anymore. All of a sudden, it seems empty. There is nothing, because what death is Jesus dying that we don't have to die? The quality of the second death. Is there any hope in the second death? Is there any coming back from the second death? Is there any connection with the Father in the second death? And so Jesus Christ is going that through that awful separation finality, and if it costs Him His existence and that vindicates God, that's what He wants. There is a song in the book of Revelation that the last generation on earth will learn the music and the words to. Do you remember the title? Moses and the Lamb. What is that song? Here's what I think it is. Remember Moses back in the Old Testament? God tested him a little bit. Look, let's just get rid of this bunch of rebels. I'll start over with you. You're faithful. We'll make this a go. You just give me permission. And Moses argues with God. Did you notice? Moses argues with God. He says to God, if you bring this people out here into the wilderness and then destroy them out in the middle of the desert, the nations around and Egypt and everyone around will laugh at the Yahweh who can't even take care of his own people. He brings them out with miracles and then he can't even take care of them. And your name will be dishonored. Your your credibility will go down. And Moses says, if that happens, what is Moses' next request? 
blot my name out of the book of life. That's not talking about temporary death, folks. That's talking about eternal death. If your name is blotted out of the book of life, that's it. It's all over. And Moses is saying, if your name is dishonored, I prefer non-existence. I'm going to say that again because that's so important. If your name is discredited and dishonored among the nations, then it isn't worth my existing. I don't want to exist anymore. My eternal life means nothing if your name is discredited. That's what Moses is saying to God. Is Jesus saying the same thing on Calvary? My existence isn't what counts. Your victory over Satan is what counts. The great controversy is what counts. Every tongue confessing is what counts. And anything that happens to me is irrelevant as long as that is done. And Jesus is saying it's not important about me. It's only important about you. You see, I believe we have had the wrong perception for a few years in our Seventh-day Adventist uh, perceptions. We have been told in recent years the most important thing for us to know on a day-by-day -day basis is, do I have the assurance of salvation? If I were to walk out of this church and be struck down in a car accident, do I have the assurance that I am right with God? Now that is a very important question. It's a question we ought to have assurance of, that Jesus Christ is our Savior at every moment, and if our breath is our la the next breath is our last breath, we are at peace with Him. It's a good question. But is that the question of Moses? And is that the question of Jesus Christ? Do I have the assurance of eternal life? It is not. I believe there is something way bigger for Seventh-day Adventists in the last generation than the question, do I have the assurance of salvation? I have a problem with that because it focuses too much on I. The I is too big in that question. And that wasn't what Moses was concerned about or Jesus was concerned about. I believe this is the question that we need to be asking today. Is what I am saying, doing, and thinking right now vindicating God or vindicating Satan? Is it telling the truth about God's character or, tell, or saying Satan has got it pretty much right? This is a way that I prefer. God's way is too hard. It's too strict. It's too narrow. I don't like to do this all the time. I kind of like my freedom to do it my way. Every moment of every day, folks, we are casting a vote as to who we prefer runs this planet. Whether we like God's way 100% because that's the only way God will accept any obedience, or whether we like God's way 50% and Satan's way 50%. Are we voting for God to end the great controversy in every day, in every act of our lives? Or are we giving Satan permission to run this planet a few more hundred years? Satan it's okay. We kind of think that your, some of your points are valid. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be a stick in the mud and somebody walk over me. I won't. And we vote for Satan to keep on running the universe a little longer. Any vote, we, any choice we make to do something we know is not in harmony with God's will is a vote to give Satan more lifespan on this planet as ruler. And that's what Moses and Jesus were not willing to do. For them, their eternal life was not the issue. It was the victory of God in the great controversy. And I believe the question for Seventh-day Adventism is not, do I have the assurance of salvation, although that's important, but is what I am saying, doing, and thinking, telling the truth about God's character and allowing God to end this controversy sooner rather than later. That is what I believe the mission of Seventh-day Adventism to be. And we have slipped on that one. We have missed our calling. It isn't our message that's our problem. It's our sense of mission that is our problem. Who we are, why we are here, what our job is, what we have been given to do by the Creator God. As a special group out of all 6,000 years of human history, no other group has been given this challenge. This is for the last generation. This is the time of victory. And that's what I believe is contained in this paragraph we've just read from Desire of Ages 753, in which Jesus is willing to go into nothingness, 
The portals of the tomb seem closed to him. And he says, if that's your will, God, your will be done. I want you to win the great controversy. And so you see why I consider this a very important paragraph. Back to the outline on the first page. Section D, omnipresence. Was Jesus present everywhere at one time? During His life on earth? No. All right. Yahweh was, Jesus wasn't. Well, the glory, section E, did Jesus bring the glory of Yahweh down to this earth? Oh my, He was a root out of dry ground, the Bible says. So I'm not even going to take time to look up those statements. You can look them up for yourself. Five points that Jesus left behind from His existence as Yahweh. His omnipotence, His memory, His knowledge of the future, His omnipresence, and His glory. Why is this important? Well, folks, the reality is we talked last night about the fact that the Christian world has a different gospel than what I believe the Bible teaches. The Christian world has a different Christ than the Bible teaches. The Christian world in general does not believe anything that I've been sharing with you over the last 20 minutes. They believe Jesus had full power. That's how He did His miracles. Ask any Christian on the street, how did Jesus do the mighty miracles? How did He raise Lazarus from the dead? And the answer will be unequivocal because He was God. God did things like that and Jesus is God. Every Christian believes that. Jesus is God. But how does He do these mighty miracles? Well, He was omnipotent. How did He know uh, what, what to do on each day? How did He read the minds of men? Because He had an omniscient mind because he was able to know all things. How did he know what his mission was? Because he remembered the past. And so most Christians believe in a Christ who did not need to exercise faith for one minute during his entire lifetime. Because God doesn't need to exercise faith, does he? God knows. Knowledge is certain with God. We don't know anything about the future, therefore it is by faith that we believe God's promises. And so most Christians believe in a Christ that never had to wrestle with faith and doubt and uncertainty and the possibility of failure. That is a totally different Christ than the Bible teaches. And I'm going to suggest that there is a question you need to ask your loved ones, your friends, your, your relatives, whoever it might be, and it's a very simple question, and you might get an, an open door to talk to them. Do you know my friend Jesus? Just ask that question. Do you know my friend Jesus? And most Christians will want to talk about Jesus. And you can open up a Christ to them that they have never heard before in their entire lives. You can tell them about a Christ that you've come to experience who knows what you're going through, who knows your frustrations, who knows your questions because he had those questions. He had those doubts, those uncertainties. And he had to trust by faith. And you can tell your friends there isn't one place you can go where Jesus hasn't walked before you. You don't have to go to counselors, priests, ministers, rabbis to learn what God's will is. You can go directly to Jesus. You can go directly to Him. You see, I believe that this is important because if it's the other way, if Christ didn't empty Himself of these things, then He was simply going through a play, prescripted in heaven. All the actors had, had learned their parts. Jesus knew his parts because he had an omniscient mind. He came down. He said the right thing. He did the right thing. Everything was finished. He went back to heaven, and the audience applauded. That was a marvelous play. We like that. There's no risk in a play. When an actor on a stage takes a gun, points it at another actor, fires, and the other actor drops to the ground, does the audience rise in horror as what is done? Well, of course not, because they know in a few minutes that dead actor will rise and take his bows. There is no risk in a play. It is prescripted. If there is no risk in Jesus coming to this earth, then we have a different Christ and a different incarnation on our hands. But the Bible teaches the risk that the Father took in sending His own Son in limited abilities as we are in limited abilities. And Satan rejoiced, we are told, when he heard that Christ was coming in human nature down to this earth because he knew he could get him. He'd gotten everyone else. He could get him if he was not operating as Yahweh. And that was the great risk of the incarnation. 
do we understand what it cost for our salvation? There's one more point, just a little point. No, not so little after all. Do you feel very comfortable talking to a person who you consider to be a holy person, a really special saint of God? Or do you feel a little bit like you're walking on eggs when you say things they might be stupid, right? Is Jesus a holy person? The holiest of all. How do you talk to a holy person so you don't appear too stupid? And so Christians came up with ways to surmount that little barrier. The first one they came up with was, guess who? His mother. We can talk to his mother. And then his mother can translate better our prayers and talk to her son. That worked for a while. And all of a sudden, the pillar of Mary begins to rise. Did you notice? She is no longer born like we're born. She gets a 4,000-year skip in heredity called the Immaculate Conception. And then when she's taken to heaven, she is taken bodily into heaven, not just in spirit form, but bodily, physically into heaven. And today she sits at the right hand of Jesus, co-dispensing the benefits of salvation to us mortals. That pillar has risen a bit, hasn't it? How do you even talk to Mary anymore? And so as the centuries passed, we came up with other helpers to Mary, didn't we? The saints. Now, why the saints? Because they all started down where we start. And have you noticed there's a saint for about every profession, every career? So you can talk to the saint who understands you because he or she identifies with you. You're down here in the mud of sin. You've gone through struggles. And so you talk to your saint who started out right where you did, knows what you're talking about, knows your feelings, understands your emotions, and that saint will take your prayer and translate it into better language so that Mary can take your prayer, translate it into even better language, give it to her son Jesus Christ, Jesus will give it to his father, and if you're lucky you might get an answer back here. Not such a little problem after all, is it? The Bible says you need how many mediators between us and the Father? One. One. Why? Because he started down here where we are. He had the same issues, the same limitations, the same need for faith, the same risk that we go through. And so he understands exactly what our emotions are. You can talk to him directly. He understands. He knows your feelings. He knows your limitations. And so Jesus is your friend. Do you know my friend Jesus? That's a good introductory starter for a conversation about salvation issues that you can share. That's where we'll close this morning. We will pick it up at the second section this afternoon, and we will ask for more wisdom as to how Jesus Christ is our Savior from sin.